Howdy folks, thanks for checking in to Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology. I am Mr. Ulrich. In this second part of our video on from genes to protein and looking at how genes work, we're going to look at translation. Over my years of teaching biology, I've had the pleasure to work with uh, native speakers of languages other than my own, other than English. Uh, and I've had to rely on other native speakers as well as online resources, Google Translate, uh, in order to take my teaching material and convert it into Korean or uh, Georgian or uh, Haitian Creole. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this video is converting from the base pair sequence of messenger RNA, uh, which is a sequence of nucleic acids, uh, into the sequence of amino acids, which is the language of proteins. In part one, we talked about taking the base sequence of the template strand of DNA, it's made up of those A's, T's, C's, and G's, and transcribing it, copying it over using the same language, base sequence language, into a disposable nucle nucleic acid called messenger RNA. And it uses the same four bases, well, not quite the same four bases, A's, U's, C's, and G's, but it's still bases, bases to bases. What we're going to talk about in this video is how we go from that base pair, uh, base sequence, excuse me, they're not pairs, the base sequence of messenger RNA um, to the amino acid sequence of proteins. And there's 20 different amino acids uh, that make up the sequences of proteins. That means that we have to do something to the bases that can't just be one base to one amino acid. Uh, we have to make up some sort of code of bases to code for each amino acid. To go in two base combinations, uh, there are 16 different two base combinations using the four bases of DNA, and so that's not going to work because there are 20 different amino acids. Uh, but when we go into triplets, uh, there are 64 different triplets of the four bases, and that's more than enough. Uh, to cover the 20 different amino acids. And that means that there's going to be uh, redundancy that's built in. It is a degenerate code, uh, and it is read in triplets. Each sequence of three bases corresponds to a particular amino acid, and it's those groups of three bases that are called codons. And so each codon codes for a particular amino acid in series. It's Francis Crick of Watson, Crick, and Franklin, who came up with the structure of DNA, uh, who first put out this idea of a triplet codon system, uh, like why did the red bat eat the fat rat? Um, and that it would be different codons would code for the uh, individual amino acids. It was Nuremberg and Kurana who actually figured out specific codons for amino acids. Uh, and they did this by synthesizing uh, messenger RNA that had the same uh, base. So it was uh, poly U, polyuracil, just uracil, 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 uracil. Uh, They fed that to ribosomes and were able to make uh, polypeptides that were all phenyl alanine. Uh, and so that gave them the idea that use UUU is, and it is, the uh, uh, triplet codon for phenylalanine. Since Nuremberg and Karana, uh, other researchers have determined all of the other codons. Uh, and it turns out that all organisms use the exact same codon system. That means that all of the uh, codons that code for leucine in uh, humans also code for leucine in starfish and in uh, bacteria as well. Uh, this is a really strong support for a common ancestor since we all use the same cellular machinery um, to copy down the code for how to make proteins. Uh, and the code is redundant. That means that, again, there's more than one codon that codes for the same amino acid. And it's kind of neat how this works. If we look over here at leucine, uh, the third base CUU, CUC, CUA, CUG, all of these code for the same amino acid leucine. Uh, that means that that third codon really doesn't matter in this case. As long as it's CU, meh, whatever, uh, it's going to code for leucine. Uh, this means that there's a spot that a mutation could take place and it still wouldn't change the amino acid and therefore isn't going to change the shape of the protein. Uh, 
Uh, a couple other notable codons. The start codon does actually code for an amino acid. It's AUG and does code for methionine. Uh, there are uh, three other stop codons that say when the end of the coding region uh, has been reached, um, uh, and those are UAA, UAG, and UGA. Obviously, you don't have to memorize these. Any questions that you're going to be given, um, you'll have this uh, universal translator table to uh, reference. Just like when I'm in class teaching biology to, uh, say, Spanish-speaking students, I rely on something to be a decoder between my sequence of phonemes uh, that encodes information that I understand to a sequence of phonemes that encodes information that they understand. In cells, uh, we need something that does exactly the same thing, and that's where we're going to meet our next type of RNA. It's called transfer RNA. Uh, and transfer RNA has a region on it that has a, the complementary um, uh, base sequence of the codon. Uh, it's called the anticodon. Uh, and it, each one of these transfer RNAs will attach to a particular amino acid. And so really what we're doing when we're translating from codons into proteins, we're really lining up these transfer RNAs with their anticodons uh, and their amino acids, uh, and then making a bond between those amino acids, and we're actually starting to make a peptide. Before we get into the specifics of the process of translation, we have now a general understanding of the central dogma of going from the uh, base pair sequence of DNA uh, hanging out in the nucleus to the uh, base sequence of messenger RNA, which can leave the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm. Uh, we make lots of different copies of that so that they can be used and destroyed. They're going to go out into the cytoplasm and complex with ribosomes to make proteins. Um, ribosomes then are like the protein factories. Um, the transfer RNAs bring the individual amino acids to the ribosomes so that they can synthesize the right sequence of amino acids to make a properly shaped protein uh, through that process of translation. And as that protein folds into its particular shape, uh, it's going to have a, you know, an effect on the organism, and that's what's going to make the trait. So this is really how we get from genes making you who you are. Let's get a little bit more detail here in our description of translation. Um, Oftentimes, uh, transfer RNA, one of the workhorses of the process, is described as having this clover leaf structure. I, I, when you look at its actual three dimensional structure that you can see there uh, in the diagram, it doesn't really look like a clover leaf. Uh, the important thing is that it has the two important parts it has the anticodon, that region that has the complementary bases uh, for the codon, uh, and then it also has on the other end, it has a three prime kind of tag end that can attach to uh, a particular particular amino acid. Each transfer RNA is loaded up with its amino acid using amino acyl transfer RNA synthetase. Uh, this enzyme uh, uses quite a bit of energy. It's going to actually take ATP all the way down to AMP, and that means that uh, the bond is pretty unstable between the uh, transfer RNA and the amino acid, and that is important because, of course, it's got to be able to break off uh, and leave the amino acid behind. Ribosomes are the other major player here in the process of translation. The job of the ribosome is to hold the messenger RNA in place, messenger RNA, excuse me, uh, in place so that the transfer RNAs, two of them can come in and hold their amino acids next to one another and a peptide bond can be formed between them. And then we start growing a polypeptide. Um, they're made of rRNA. Um, and proteins. They're not wrapped up in a membrane, so it's uh, sometimes hard to describe it as an organelle. Uh, it's really an enzyme. Uh, there are two subunits to each ribosome. There is a large subunit and a small subunit. The two subunits will clamp down kind of around the beginning of a messenger RNA strand, and the codons will kind of go through this the three spots that are available for codons on the uh, ribosome. 
Uh, the first spot is called the A site or amino acyl transfer RNA site. This is the one that brings in the new um, transfer RNAs that are carrying amino acids will fit into the site. And then the whole thing, the whole ribosome will slide up one. Um, and the next site is called the P site. Uh, this is the one that holds um, all of the polypeptide chain that's been growing up until that point. Uh, the third spot is called the uh, E site. Yes, it spells ape. That is a good uh, way to remember it. And that's the exit site or the empty site. That's the spot where uh, the transfer RNA actually breaks off from the amino acid and from the codon and can kind of go off and pick up another um, amino acid. Now the way this works um, is first the uh, first amino acid is brought in, that's uh, methionine on the AUG, and that actually goes into the uh, P spot first. Uh, and then the next amino acid comes in uh, to the A spot, uh, and those two get bonded together. The whole thing carries over one, and uh, the first transfer RNA is kicked out. Uh, that opens up the A site, the next amino acid comes in and uh, continues to uh, add things one after another. And this is going to add amino acids, excuse me, one after another. Uh, and this is going to continue making the polypeptide. So the polypeptide gets, gets longer and longer and longer until we get to a stop codon. At that point, a uh, protein is, uh, puts, is put into that A spot and that allows the um, uh, transfer RNA to move into the next spot without being attached to an amino acid and the whole thing breaks off and you have created a polypeptide. Not all proteins are bound to go to the same place. Some of them are secreted, some of them stay in the nucleus, some of them go to the mitochondria, some of them are going to be parts of the cell membrane and so they need to uh, go to the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, that means that each gene actually has a section of it that codes for a non-protein peptide uh, that's going to act as a signal, it's act as an address label. And this short uh, sequence of amino acids will bond with another protein, uh, and that protein can then complex with another protein, say, in this case, uh, in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, and that'll cause that protein to be synthesized right into the cisternal space of the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, where it needs to go to be part of the cell membrane. There's a lot to it, but you need to be able to tell the basic story of protein synthesis, starting from DNA, um, having messenger RNA made by the action of RNA polymerase, uh, making the long pre-mRNA that needs to have the exons spliced together so that the introns can be kicked out. Uh, that messenger RNA also needs to be protected from the crazy endonucleases out there in the cytoplasm. Uh, so we stick a, a, a GTK, GTP cap on the 5' prime end and a poly A tail on the 3' prime end and send that mature RNA out into the cytoplasm to hopefully find a large and small ribosomal subunit before it's degraded by the endonucleases out there. The ribosome is going to provide the uh, different spots. It's not even important that you know them is A, P, and E, but the different locations for the transfer RNAs to complex with codon by codon with the um, messenger RNA um, so that those transfer RNAs bring the proper amino acids into place uh, so that we can start to make a growing polypeptide. Phew! Well, we'll leave it there. Uh, thanks again for checking in to Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology. Uh, I'm Mr. Ulrich. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email, put them in the comments section, contact me on Google Classroom, however you got to do it. Other than that, thanks for checking in, and we'll see you in class.